This is the Healthcare.ai live broadcast with the Health Catalyst data science team, where we discuss the latest machine learning topics with hands-on examples. And here's your host, Levi Thatcher. Hi, everyone. I'm Levi Thatcher. I'd like to introduce you to Adam Frisbee, Mike Messaduno from Health Catalyst Data Science. If you, this is the first time joining us, we are going to reach out each week through these broadcasts to help interact with the healthcare community and the machine learning community to help people learn how to do hands-on machine learning and get involved yourself with your data. And to start off today's broadcast, we're going to start with the mailbag, see what people have been chatting about, what questions you guys might have that we can help with. Mike? Great. Thanks, Levi. So um, just to give an overview of the, of the session, um, you know, a couple of housekeeping things. We want to make sure that uh, you guys are interacting with us through the chat because that's the way we're going to get your questions addressed and be able to have a conversation, make this interactive. So to do that, make sure you're logged into YouTube. You can chat right on the healthcare.ai slash broadcasts page, or you can do it on the YouTube page itself. Uh, make sure to change your resolution. We may be looking at text on the screen, so if you can support a high definition resolution, that'll definitely help. And uh, please remember to you know show us some love and subscribe by clicking the bell for notifications on this channel as well. Um, so with that, we will move on to the mailbag. We've had some questions from users over the past week, and we're excited to yeah. share, share our opinions on them. Then we'll talk about some, uh, some really interesting news articles that came out this week in deep learning. And uh, finally move on to the, the real uh, beef and potatoes the of, of the lesson. Of the lesson. Uh, be talking about MOOCs. Uh, which are massively online courses. There's an extra O in there. Open, open, open online courses. courses. Thank you, yeah. Adam. Uh, and finally, you know, we'll we'll cover some of the questions that the chat has. So, I guess let's move on to the mailbag. Uh, Levi, can you can you talk to us about the first question? We had some um, a lot of people kind of asking just for a more broad overview of machine learning. So, like, is machine learning for predictive only? Great question whoever that was. Do we have a username? We or do don't we? have a username okay. with that one. Well, whoever you were, thank you. So the idea with machine learning is that it's not just predictive. You know, predictive is a major part of it, but the idea is that you can make predictions or you can analyze data. Let's say that you have high cost patients coming into your hospital. You know, they're there for a long time. They have expensive treatments, surgeries, what have you. One thing that you can do with machine learning that's not predictive is do what's called k-means clustering. So it's an unsupervised type method, and we won't get too technical, but the idea is that if you want to identify the different kinds of patients that are coming in that are high cost, you know, maybe there's various attributes about these folks that are putting them to you know, three or four groups that you want to learn about. That would be one application of machine learning that's not predictive in nature, but more for analysis. Great question. So does it require big data? Great question as well. No, it doesn't, and that's one of the awesome things about healthcare AI and machine learning in general is that you can do it on your own computer. So with healthcare AI and these packages from R and Python, you can put them on your laptop, play with a few thousand rows or you know a couple million rows, depending on how much memory you have. But it doesn't require big data, and big data it seems like is the buzz around it has kind of died down a little bit because of that. Machine learning has kind of taken over, and um, we're, we're excited about that fact that you can do it right at home. I think people should remember that our personal computers are so powerful now. The, yeah, phone in yeah. my, the phone in my pocket is 10 times more powerful than the most powerful thing in the 1970s. Yeah, it's so crazy. So it's very interesting to, to realize the power that we actually can do with our own individual systems. We don't need huge clusters of machines like in the past. Yeah, in the future we'll be doing it on our, our smartphone sort of thing. I'm going to look for the contact. <laughs> so, there so as well. Wearable tech. So if we want to, you know, what is the machine learning process like? We've, we've also had a lot of questions about that. Is it just model building or is there more to it? Yeah, so it starts with you know, getting to know your data. What are the distributions of particular variables? Do they make sense? Do you have a lot of missing values? Do you need to cut out certain rows because most of those rows have missing data? So you'll want to consider some of those type of questions. Maybe you want to do some plots to look at distributions. Maybe you'll want to transform certain columns in a certain way. Let's say that you have a latitude and longitude for a particular you know, set of patients and you would need to turn that into, maybe it's a zip code sort of thing. So that, that's sort of the first step. And then after that, you try a couple different algorithms and compare your column set with those different algorithms to say, okay, well, algorithm A gives us this accuracy for our patients. Algorithm B gives us certain other accuracy. 
And then from there you go and deploy the algorithm that worked best, such that each night you're getting those refresh predictions for things like um, collapse prediction or readmissions prediction. So that's kind of the general workflow, and we can go into a little more detail perhaps in another episode. It's a great idea. Yeah, in fact, actually next week's episode, we're going to be focusing on the machine learning uh, platform just so that we can uh, make sure that we know you know, everybody's on the same page and talking about the nuances of how you actually build a machine learning model from start to finish. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm excited for that. Really looking forward to that episode. But uh, we had one more question that's a bit nitty gritty, so I'll, t I'll try and frame it for you guys. Um, we had someone doing some machine learning and they were playing with different algorithms. And so when, when they got their results from each algorithm back, they, they were seeing um, feature importance for the two algorithms was vastly different meaning that the two different algorithms were using different information to come to similar conclusions about their predictions. Oh. So basically, the question was, why is that? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So that's one thing in Health AI, we've tried to offer up this guidance to whoever you know, the end user is. So when you run an algorithm on your data, not only do you get a, an accuracy score, or, you know, performance metric that, that spit out, but you also get guidance as to which features perhaps you can leave out of the data set, and like Mike is saying, that differs. So if I'm doing a lasso algorithm, the ordered list would be different than if I'm doing a random forest algorithm. And that's just due to the different ways the algorithms work, right? So a lasso is a linear model, random forest is an ensemble method that combines output from a lot of different trees. And there's actually a blog post up on Healthcare AI that touches on that. It's uh, a few weeks back. But the idea is that different algorithms calculate things in different ways. And so, you know, keep that in mind when you're looking at the output from Healthcare AI. Great. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. So thanks, that's, thanks for all those great questions from the users. And uh, we'll be sure to keep monitoring the chat and, you know, answering your questions as they come up. Uh, we'll also be collecting them throughout the week so that we can answer them at the beginning of every show. Um, let's move on to machine learning in the news. This week there was a ton of really interesting news uh, surrounding deep learning especially. Um, one study in particular, you know, someone was, a group in France was using a neural network, which is a deep learning technique, to synthetically age faces or make them look younger. This is crazy. And so. That's really interesting because right now the only tools to do that sort of thing are Photoshop. And we've had the cap you know, deep learning researchers have had the capability to do uh, artificial aging for a while, but usually what happens is that you kind of lose the identity of the face at the same time. So this study is really exciting because they found a way to use two different deep learning methods uh, towards the same output to not only preserve the identity of the face, but also to help age or make them younger. That's um, amazing. And so we thought that was really, really interesting. So you can, is that Richard Gere? <laughs> what, what celebrity is the middle one there? Uh, I think it, it might, like, yeah. it does yeah, look like Yeah, so you're it, able yeah. to pick which decade you prefer for Richard Gere. You know, 50s Richard Gere, <laughs> 30s Richard Gere. Adam? Uh, 50s Adam. Fif Wait. What? 50, 50s Richard Gere. Oh, I'm 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 all about the 30s Richard Gere. Yeah, that's a pretty good decade yeah. for him. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, that's that's interesting, <laughs> Mike. So you know, deep learning is being used on the cutting edge of research, but then also, you know, it's it's being used in everyday products. Um, there's a long read here. Can you switch yeah. to the next one? There's a long read here, but the. Uh, uh, inside Facebook's AI machine kind of goes through how deep learning and artificial intelligence are really just built into Facebook's platform. So, you know, whether or not you know it, some of those recommendations they're serving up, the way they're interacting with all of the data they collect is with artificial intelligence. So it's kind of an interesting article about um, how the director of engineering transformed them into an artificial intelligence first company in the last few years. And I think that's definitely going to be a, a common theme in companies these yeah, days. You'll see that from uh, every tech company in Silicon Valley. We'll pretty much have a story like this up on the web soon. Uh, we'll actually drop these links in our show notes as well afterwards. So you know what's weird about into. that, if I can interrupt you? Yeah, please. Uh, when I buy something at Walmart or some, some place that has a really sophisticated point of sale system, and I come home or I log on Facebook in my phone, I'll often see an advertisement related to the physical thing that I purchased. Mm -hmm. And that's when things start to get a bit scary for me. A little creepy? A <laughs> little bit, yes. So maybe you made that purchase that was suggested? Um, yeah, well, I wasn't going to uh, <laughs> I wasn't going to announce that publicly, but, ye but yes. Yes, yes, okay. Yes. So effective and They creepy. got me, they got me. Uh, it happens. <laughs> 
And then, so I guess, and deep learning is, um, you know, so we've seen it all across the news, it's a big topic. Uh, and then in a very data science and machine learning-esque way, um, someone compiled a, uh, a list of um, all the most cited machine learning or deep learning papers uh, into a GitHub repository. So, you know, bibliographies are over. We're all on GitHub now. Yeah. So we might as well just post our, post our reference list on GitHub, too. But check and, this uh, out. Um, I'll scroll down here a little bit, because they break it down by category, it looks like. They have an awesome badge, which is awesome. I, I guess you can, you can put an awesome badge on there. You know? It's so we subjective. Can we get one exact of those badges? We should get an awesome yeah, badge on our nice. repos. <laughs> Okay, awesome. Oh, they have an awesome list criteria. So I guess if they define yeah. right. what it takes. That's interesting because <laughs> the data science process, you always have to define yeah, that. Yeah, you to define it. To solve. You're good to go. Yeah. So definitely some awesome articles this week. Uh, check them out again in the show notes on the YouTube live page. We'll drop those in here shortly after the broadcast. And again, with the, the mailbag, you know, reach out, let us know what you're wanting to talk about, what questions you have. The, the, this show can be whatever you want it to be, so please drive it. We're happy to answer anything in machine learning and healthcare and you know, the intersection of those two. Uh, anything else in the news this week? Or? Man, there's a lot of great stuff, but I think we're out of time for the news. So yeah. let's, um, let's move on to our main program and uh, we'll make sure we get to talk about some of those new articles next week. That sounds great. So the main topic for today, we'll always have sort of a main, you know, lesson or tutorial or something like that. So today we want to focus on MOOCs. MOOCs. Yeah. So MOOCs are, is a massively open online course. And we brought Adam Frisby on as a guest today as he is an instructor at the University of Utah. And do you want to give a little bit about, you know, how long you've been up there, what kind of courses you teach? Yeah, I actually... My full-time job is here at Health Catalyst. I, I'm lucky enough and privileged enough to uh, teach in the Information Systems and Masters of Science in Information Systems programs at the University of Utah. And so I've been doing that since uh, 2014. So Three years three, coming up on. Yeah, coming up on, coming up on three years. And it's just been really incredibly enjoyable and rewarding for me, and I've got to teach some data-related classes recently, like data warehousing, for example. And um, very topical. Yeah. So, uh, but the the other side of that is being a teacher for me means being a perpetual, lifelong learner. I have never learned so much as when I've decided to teach. Yeah. Um, and I think that's sort of true for if, if you were to po uh, take a poll of college teachers. Um, that probably would be a sentiment that, that a lot of us share. Um, and so I love to do online courses and it helps if they're free. So MOOCs are, yeah, yeah. Uh, MOOCs are massively online open courses. Uh, many of them are free. Some of them are uh, free or you pay a little bit of money to get a verified certificate or something. Okay, so that's an interesting point. Right. So they've got huge in data science and Adam's taking a few of these MOOCs himself. He's mm -hmm. always diversifying, always learning. And so some people out there might ask like, okay, well, what's the, we'll get to the certificate in a second, but like, what's the benefit of a MOOC over more formalized education like at your university? Yeah, great question. So um, I'm going to be a little bit biased on, on the answer to that, and I'm going to say that nothing can really, in my opinion, nothing can take the place of a university education where you physically go somewhere with a bunch of learners that are interested in the same topic, and um, you enroll in an, in an official degree program or do some sort of uh, professional education. I don't think anything can take the place of that because um, uh, it's just been true that debating with other students and with professors and teachers in real time is a really, really effective way to learn, and it's how we've always done it since medieval universities. Um, since medieval times. Since medieval times. Okay, so right. but you're doing MOOCs for data science because maybe the program's not there at the U, or you want to do it in your spare time, or well, the program is there at the U. However, I think MOOCs are an uh, an excellent, and I would even go so far as to maybe say perfect addendum to one's Ooh. formal education. Um, because MOOCs are, uh, they tend to be more focused in my opinion. If you want a MOOC on specifically on R, there are those available. If you want a MOOC specifically on machine learning or a subtopic of machine learning, they are available for sure. And so you cut out the fluff, focus yeah. on the topic at hand. Right. Awesome. And usually for free. 
Usually for or, free. Or there's a, at least a question. free option. Yeah, so what, what is the difference? So sometimes courses will let you do either. So why would one get the certificate? And have you gotten the certificates? or have you? Uh, I, I usually do the certificates, um, but I do them for me. Um, because, for example, one of the main uh, MOOC sort of leaders is Coursera. And they offer a certificate program where you pay like $50 a month and then you can get a verified certificate. And then what you can do is log on to Coursera at, at any time and you can look at your transcript and look at all the certificates you've earned. Whereas if you don't do that, you can, you can take the classes and do everything, but I, uh, they don't keep a history and they don't keep a, a transcript for mm. you. So that's an advantage for me. A little motivation. Yeah, and you're paying, you're paying money, so it's a little motivation to actually complete a, a MOOC that you, that you start. And the other thing is, and I really don't think employers necessarily care if you get a verified certificate or not. So you have to do it for yourself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it's nice, I guess, to see it on the resume. If two people are equal, that maybe be, would be beneficial. But it always else. come out. Yeah, it always come out whether you know the stuff or not. So learn the stuff primarily. Yeah, it's a, and if nothing else, on your LinkedIn because uh, you can put little badges and oh, stuff. Oh, the badge! So, yeah, like the awesome badge. Yeah, awesome yeah. <laughs> I have tons of those. Yeah, oh, that's awesome nice. Badges. Yeah, yeah <laughs> totally. Okay, so should we go into what are some of our recommended MOOCs? We, we've been yeah, looking yeah. around. Mike's been really helpful. Do you so want to give a little bit? Of, I guess some. You know, before we kind of get into our recommended classes, I'm kind of curious. You know, there's so many of them. What What would you look for in a in a MOOC? Uh, ratings. So just like anything else on the interwebs, uh, ratings are king. You don't buy an Amazon product that has one star. It's true. Um, uh, one of the big sort of paid MOOC providers is Udemy, U-D-E-M-Y.com. Udemy. Yes. And they always have sales. Their classes are usually like 200 bucks, but they always, it's every time I've ever logged in there, it's like $200 slash slash through and then it's $20 to take the class. So every time, so I don't worry about the cost on those. It's $20 a class is totally worth it. Um, this one instructor that I really like that I kind of follow on Udemy is Kirill. Um, and he teaches a lot of the data science stuff, but he's always got five stars and like 2,000 reviews. And so I trusted that. And so I bought his course and it turned out that it actually was a really cool course. So, so I do recommend him as an instructor. So like good material, good style, or like what was it about him? Uh, engaging style, not boring like me. No. no, no. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not, no. But yeah, really engaging style. But, but another thing about him is um, everything in the course is live. Is live. So, so he's, he's typing the code? And yes, like he's typing working. the code. He's showing, he's telling you exactly what he's doing. And he actually writes a little, a little R comment right before what he's about to type, saying mm -hmm. this is about to do this. Um, so it's really easy to follow along with. And um, he has data sets for you already prepared um, for, for his exercises. So that's really good too. That's really nice. Um, other ones I've taken like Coursera are, are good, don't get me wrong, but they tend to be like PowerPoint or slideshow focused where it's not really live coding. So um, it, th there's a preference thing there too because some people might, might do fine with that. And it, yeah. you know, it seems like so. hands-on is good. I guess that's kind of our theme as for well. For me, yeah. Yeah, so a couple of questions on, have come up kind of on the, these lines. Um, mm -hmm. We had one person ask, you know, where we can find good publicly available data sets. You know, oh, sometimes they come with the MOOCs, but, you know, yeah. not always. And so where's, where are some good places to look? Can I, can I answer that? Yeah, or please can I, do. Okay, please well, do. Uh, in my university class, uh, currently data warehousing, we're, um, one of the projects that we're doing is take a data set, do, uh, put it in a data warehouse, do some analytics on it. That's the group project. Um, so I had to find these uh, a bunch of, there's a lot of lists of data. If you just Google public data sets, they're all over the place. And I told students that I would give them extra credit if they did some of the weirder ones. So if you Google, <laughs> if you Google weird public data sets, you'll find Bigfoot sightings. Oh, man. Uh, like GIS maps of Bigfoot sightings. Um, there's also UFO sightings. So there's a bunch of weird ones out so there. So your class did some of these? Uh, they have, well, the, the group project does not do until the end of the semester, but... but uh, Hopefully um, they're working Yeah, them. exactly. I, I want to know. I, I said if you can ac accurately predict when I'm going to see Bigfoot and where, then you will get an automatic A in the class. Quite the prediction. Yeah. There are so many public data. 
Uh, data.gov has. Oh, yeah. Uh, data.gov it has all kinds of stuff about the demographics of the United States, health health related or otherwise. Yeah. It's, it's a data. It's been kind of a nice initiative. I think in the past uh, administration, there was a lot of effort underway to actually put those data sets out there. Get it before Trump takes it away is what, I, is what I'm going to say. It's probably good advice. <laughs> well, so I had one as well. There's a UCI, so the University of California, <laughs> Irvine, has a great... Um, UCI will go to the data sets. So while, while Levi pulls that up, I'd also just like to make a plug for APIs, which are um, you know live streams of information coming from different companies and websites. And you know Uber has one, Twitter has one, Reddit has one. Any website that's collecting data, you can you can kind of tap into that hose and uh, pull data off their website. To, uh, to use for your own analysis. That'll make for a really fun project. So yeah. So like where are Ubers in my city or like where are the buses in my city? Yeah, exactly. How are they late sort of thing? Yeah, and this one at Irvine is amazing for machine learning in particular. So they have a nice breakdown in terms of whether it's a classification or regression type data set, the number of rows, the number of columns, the year it came out. And we'll throw that one up and some of these other ones as well in the the show notes after we're done. Yeah, definitely don't worry about, you know, writing down everything we say. It's going to go in the show notes. Every class we talk about, all the links we pull up, everything will be in the notes. So don't worry yeah. about that at all. Sounds good. So do you want to talk about some specific MOOCs that we'd recommend? Yeah, I guess, well, kind of, I'm still kind of concerned about how to choose one. Well, you know, we've, yeah, we've been through the that. You know, we want a good teacher, we want good content, but what content is, you know, what, what is good content? What are we looking for? How do we choose it? Yeah, well, being you know data science focused and machine learning focused pod, um, broadcast, kind of podcast, we're not there yet, but broadcast is making it appropriate that we talk about that topic. So things with R, Python, data science, and you know the, the sort of subfields that lie under those. So there were a few that we looked at that talked about data science, but talked about maybe older technologies or technologies that we really don't use and our colleagues don't use. So we kind of ignored those ones. Um, do you want to kind of talk about this free code camp article we found? And yeah, sure. That a little bit. So, in in a very data science oriented fashion, um, someone wrote a blog post about MOOCs, and we thought it was really engaging because it it kind of t covered, you know, all these points that we've we've talked about how the class has to cover the 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 content, it has to use the right tools, <laughs> and it has to be highly rated. So, someone kind of scraped the uh, the website Class Central for reviews of all these different online courses and came up with a list of um, great ones. And so this person did it as the culmination of their uh, self-guided MOOC-based data science degree that they claim they paid a lot less for than a pompous academic degree <laughs> and uh, sometimes these pompous. guys have PhDs so uh, <laughs> just as much success <laughs> rebels playing academia so um, but we really like that because I do want to keep my job <laughs> <laughs> of course you do <laughs> um, so we had uh, yeah so so we really like the flow of that article and um, uh, some of the recommendations you know based on the fact that they're they're grounded in in data, you know, yeah. they have reviews to back them up, they have um, what people say about them. Exactly. Um, it's and not just your friend saying like, hey, you should try this one. Yeah, <laughs> and we thought we'd, we'd throw this out there since a lot of people ask us both, you know, in the community and Help Catalyst, they say, how do I get more in machine learning and data science? And we liked a couple of these that he mentions in particular, and so do we want to to go into the course, into the YouTube. Let me just interject one thing. For for every MOOC that I've ever come across, you can always watch some sort of preview video or, oh, yeah, or preview of it. Yeah. So that's one thing I did, I did with this Carol guy on on Udemy is I watched his preview video and that helped sell his his MOOC. So. Yeah. And the syllabus is online too. Mm -hmm. So if you just want to read through it, you can read through it. Right. Um, so I guess, you know, where's a good place to start? We want to learn about the machine learning Python, uh, pipeline. We want to learn about, like, what data science even is. Yeah, so there's the data science toolbox, getting at Mike's comments there on Coursera. If you're looking to learn about the field in a broad sense and kind of get a flavor for what tools you'd even be using, we'd recommend this one. And is this one by Roger Payne? It is. Uh, Roger Payne and his, his sort of John Hopkins uh, cohort there. Ah. 
Um, and that course is really awesome because they they show you what tools data scientists use, how to get them, and and the basics of how to use them. So we're talking Git, mm -hmm. GitHub, R and R Studio. Awesome. So yeah, if those things are new to you, those concepts are not familiar, uh, check this uh, MOOC out first. We'll they put also, this in the show notes. Sorry, they also go into a little bit of theory of, of, of what you want to do as a data science. For example, ask the right questions. Oh yeah, a little bit <laughs> of know, process stuff too. Stuff like that, yeah. yeah. That's really helpful. Yeah. yeah, that's really fantastic because, you know, a lot of times you'll see a list of, so you want to become a data scientist, you must learn all of these things. It's and, overwhelming. Yeah, it's overwhelming, and the lists are, they compete with each other, so you don't know if you really need what. And this is kind of like, it's a trailer to the movie, you know. It kind of fills in on getting that big picture oriented in your mind so that you know what you might want to go pursue a little Speaking bit more. Speaking of yourself. movies, have you guys, do you guys remember Star Trek IV? Uh, Can't say I saw it. Okay, yeah. so Spock's dad in Star Trek IV has an awesome quote. He says, it is difficult to provide an answer when one does not know the question. Ooh, that's pretty deep. Sure and remember, knows. and remember, they're talking about uh, the the whales are trying to talk to them in Star Trek IV. The and there are no are whales. Water? There are no whales in the twenty third century because they had become extinct by that time. From pollution and You're right. et cetera. Because we suck at maintaining our planet. It's to a certain extent. <laughs> okay, so you gotta know the question if you're looking for an answer is what we're getting at here. So if you're wondering if you should drop out of your PhD program to become a data scientist, you may want to do this MOOC first and <laughs> then decide to drop out or not. So then programming is also a really big part of, uh, of data science. You know, it's, it's kind of the, the most basic tool that you have to know. And so what, are, what languages? Well, what have you been delving into, Adam? You're going down this path. The MOOCs that I've done have been focused on R um, because, well, I mean, I think it's, I think I think well you know R R and Python are kind of the two big players right now but but I think I just chose one and, and went with it is yeah. what happened um, R just kind of I don't know it was concise spoke, naming spoke to me a little bit more than Python but I don't I, I think there's a lot of personal preference that goes into play there yeah both are awesome and so we found this amazing uh, MOOC here that you have actually done and we found this in the mm -hmm. list that we referenced yeah. earlier. And so this is by Jose Portilla, mm -hmm. and you recommend Jose? Yeah, he's yeah he's really good. Uh, not not my favorite, uh, but that but good. But second probably yeah. on on Udemy. Yeah. Okay, and mm -hmm. this is Data Science and Machine Learning Bootcamp with R. Mm -hmm. Now look at the price on that. See, it's they they all oh, say ninety percent. They off. all say ninety percent off all the time. I've never lo I've never paid full price for a Udemy course. I think it's I think that's how they get you. But oh yeah, it's worth it. It really is. It's worth twenty bucks. Trust me. Check it out. Yeah. Okay. And then if you're looking for something a little bit more broad. So I'm enrolled in this one now. And it, how does it break it down? So it's Python and R. So is each segment in both languages or? Um, he, well, actually, I just barely started this one. So I, I can't, I can't answer that. But, but it is by Kirill. I, I, this is my favorite instructor on Udemy, Carol uh, Aramenko. Carol. And he, he also runs a data science podcast called Super Data Science. Ooh. So sign up for that too. It's I mean, it's not as cool as this as this but broadcast, cool. but it's pretty cool. He interviews some some really um, uh, accomplished data science scientists every week, and so it's pretty. Oh. cool. Superdatascience.com. If I can plug his. Uh, no. Yeah, yeah. superdatascience.com. <laughs> that's where, that's where his. Effort. Yeah, that's where his data sets are too for these courses. So. Oh, that's handy. Yeah. Speaking of open data sets. Right. Yeah. Awesome. So again, we'll throw those all up afterwards. Don't feel like you need to write them down. And uh, again, we, we love the mail. Keep that coming in. Next week, we'll be going through how to deploy a model in your laptop, on your server. We'll, we'll give you the full run through as to the data prep, developing a model, deploying a model, and actually using the predictions for something cool. But uh, anything else today? I think we. Yeah, I just had a, a one other thing I wanted to say. So, you know, maybe you've gone through all these classes and you, you start to feel pretty good about the tool set. Where do you go next? Are you still kind of in the process? Uh, I am still. Uh, I'm both in the process and outside of the process and very different. I'm kind of like Batman. I'm teaching, yeah, doing yeah. everything. So, yeah. Kind of like Bruce Wayne and, and Batman. Although I wish I was rich. Anyway. Ah. Um, <laughs> What I would say is there are a, a lot of uh, there are a lot of places online where there are kind of like competitions mm -hmm. where um, 
it's like take this data set and whoever can do the best, the coolest thing with it or whatever, or whoever can make the best prediction or whatever. Um, there are a lot of websites like that, and so that is really good practice. So you talk Kaggle? Kaggle. We, we yeah. believe we're pronouncing it correctly. K K K. -K Some people say Kaggle, but I no. think that's a different thing. <laughs> yeah, Kaggle. stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we have a uh, slightly off topic, but we have a BI expert, uh, Curtis Harris, who who does ta a lot of Tableau oh, stuff. Oh yeah. And every Monday, there's like a Tableau Monday thing that they do. Competition. Um, yeah, it's, it's like a competition, and he does those every Monday. And so he is so good at Tableau just from doing those. So I would say, just like math or anything else, I mean, practice, 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 practice until you tell you're blue in the face. Really, is the way to. Yeah, to yeah, it. that's fantastic. Did you have anything, Mike, in terms of? Yeah, and, and I think Paul just suggested it as well. You know, if you're looking for a data science job, it's a great using GitHub to showcase the work you've done is a really great way to to get yourself a portfolio almost. You know. Yeah, these, yeah. These degrees are so new. The best way to show that you're capable of doing the work is to kind of put it online and show it to people on GitHub. But, yeah. But what's a huge advantage of these degrees being so new? Anybody can get into it. That's true. It's if open. You have the, if it's wild west it, out here. If you have the <laughs> desire, um, you know, anybody can. I think I think it's possible for anybody that has a desire to step into something like this. That's one of the awesome things about this whole open source data science movement is that it broadens the scope and anybody can get involved. And speaking of portfolios, um, blogs are another fantastic way. We actually talked about this. I gave a little bit of a talk at Adam's class the other night. went into how By the way, blog good job. Oh, thanks. That was nice of you that let me come up. But blogging is an awesome way to work through different data sets, you know, ask questions of the data, make some visualizations, maybe some predictions, and talk about what you're learning in your process. And be vulnerable. Yeah, people love vulnerability. If you, I, I I do some light blogging, but I like I, I mean I, I'm fine pointing out my mistakes because it's I, I want people to see if they ever come across my blog, which is unlikely, but I want people to see that that my learning process is no different than anybody else's. You know, it's endearing. Yeah, and you yeah. learn as you type. That's one thing with writing in general. You have to really learn something to be able to write about it. Yeah. So just some random thoughts on data science there, kind of meandering, but I liked it. So, anything else from the we're, we're, not, we're not a scripted show. Yeah, though, so, unscripted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's been quite a bunch of, of uh, comments on the chat. You know, maybe Good. we can just run through them real quick. Yeah. Um, you know, Paul is wondering, you know, if we have any thoughts on marrying clinical data from the electronic health records with socioeconomic data. Oh, yeah. And like, oh, man, that is such a great idea. Usually when you're doing machine learning, the more data sets or sources you can pull together to get a complete picture of what's going on, the better your models are going to be. So definitely something we try to do. Definitely, yeah. That's the idea of the data warehouse. You might have heard of it, but you know, the more data sets, the better, we always say. So any other you know, chat questions? or Yeah, we, we also have somebody asking uh, if adversarial neural nets are good for uh, oncology work. And, Is you that know, English? Well, <laughs> those are all the rage these days I hear. <laughs> GANs, um, generative adversarial nets. Um, yeah, probably cool with probably. oncology data. We haven't tried it yet, but give it a whirl and let us know. It seems like cancer prediction and classification is really the cutting edge in machine learning right now. Protein folding. Yeah, just because the application, you know, there's so much low hanging fruit in other areas like hospital readmissions and hospital based infections that it's hard to justify spending all that resource and on yeah, cancer yeah. classification. you got to start with the most practical yeah. use case and move up from there, which is what we're trying to do. But eventually that's going to move out of the academic realm and into the industry, you know, we'll see that in hospitals. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's what healthcare is all about, hastening that transition. And then Adam, we had a question for you specifically. Um, do you have any experience with classes on Redshift? Uh, actually, yeah, that's what we're focusing on in my class currently. This wasn't scripted. Um, I, <laughs> I see that one of my former students has asked that question. <laughs> um, hi, Amelia. Um, <laughs> yeah, actually, it's been really great. Um, if, you, if you don't know, Redshift is a, is a cloud data warehousing platform offered by Amazon. Um, and it's 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 a distributed data oh, warehouse, yeah. and so it's it's really uh, it's really fast. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. um, the other classes are using an older technology, but this semester I asked our department chair. I said I really want to try. I want I really want to use this new 
technology because it's it's what people are actually using out in the you know in the working world. Yeah. And my department chair was extremely supportive of me, and so I'm very excited about this. And students are seeming to like it. So that's really cool. Yeah. So Amazon Redshift, if you guys are interested in data warehousing, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of pre-built labs you can you can do. So. Oh, and the nice thing with Amazon or AWS is you can use it for free if mm -hmm. you don't use that much compute power. They have a free tier, right? Yes. yes. And we've been told that Azure and Adobe also do. So. Awesome. That's so, right. Whatever so, you want to use. Yeah. Everything is very sure. open. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, to no a excuse. point. <laughs> so small data. <laughs> small data. Seems New term? <laughs> not mine, but. <laughs> OK. So we had one more question uh, concerning the data. And uh, someone asked, Bob asked if, uh, if Health Catalyst could make patient level data that's de-identified available to educators and researchers and analysts and people who want to tinker with it. Like, what are, what are the, the problems or, yeah. you know, how possible is that? That's one of the things we're excited about with healthcare AI and machine learning in general is not only offering up the algorithms, but these open data sets to accelerate research in you know, healthcare and machine learning. And we have this CAFE project, which is going to aggregate data from multiple health systems. And th th there's some way, and the details haven't been sorted out, but in the future, we're eager to, eager to provide such data sets for you know, exactly those reasons you mentioned. We're starting to do that internally. So it's, it's, it's not unreasonable to think that, that, that at some point they can be public, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely a challenging subject, though, with all of the uh, HIPAA. The HIPAA compliance yeah. and the patient-specific information that has to get removed. I mean, think about what's on a medical record, though. Yeah. I mean, everything about yeah. you. And identity theft is such a huge thing, anyway. So we're skating there, but it might be a bit. Great. Well, um, I think if, unless you yeah, guys you have other to stuff to cover. Um, Let me just say something about this. Redshift question. Sorry to. Go for it. Back to Redshift. <laughs> um, I will say if you want to learn Redshift or anything on Amazon, go to quicklabs.com, Q-W-I-K labs.com. They they're an official Amazon partner. It's, they're not exactly MOOCs because it's in an individual labs. They, they, the, the lab spins you up a, an individual instance just for you. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, it's like 10 or $15 a lab or something. That's but, not bad. But, um, really, really valuable. So that's Very what we're cool. doing in my class. That's so. awesome. Well, yeah, we'll throw that in the, the chat or in the, the show notes for afterwards. Other than that, thanks for joining us, Adam. Oh, yeah, yeah so anytime. Much, Adam. Sure. Okay. And, uh, uh, yeah, feel free to subscribe. Uh, you'll notice that on Healthcare AI and in the YouTube live chat as well. Um, thanks for joining. We'll see you next week.